Battles in a Future State 1. Why such a forest of concrete walls? Saddam Hussein wondered in one of his early visits to Haifa Street. Two, this presentation is of eight parts covering four points. It looks into commissioning eight housing and institutional projects on Haifa Street in Baghdad in the 1980s. These ambitious experiments ran parallel to the battles of the Iran-Iraq war. The 1990s economic sanctions on Iraq enacted the social law of the street. How the interiors of the apartments on this street were exhibited for the first time in the U.S. military videos recording the movements of American soldiers during the Battle of Haifa Street in 2006, and how pictures of these houses can be found today on real estate websites, allowing us to imagine how much it would cost to own one apartment in a slowly recovering Baghdad. This presentation singles out monocultural practices and strategies as they shape military, artistic, and architectural images. Three. I was meeting with architect Maad Alusi in an art gallery in Amman. We were discussing his first book, Story of a Street, in which he details his role in the development of Haifa Street projects. An hour later, a cake showed up from the back office. The gallery was celebrating Alusi's, Alusi's birthday. It was an emotional moment. I took two group photos and someone took the third with me in the picture. Upon seeing the picture, my sister commented, you'll probably put this cake in your project. Between 1980 and 1988, Haifa Street saw large development projects while at the same time, a war was raging around the Iran-Iraqi borders. Haifa Street development was a deferred plan picked up by Saddam Hussein upon assuming his presidency in 1979. As big as it was, Haifa Street was not more than one part of a larger campaign to prepare Baghdad to host a non-aligned movement summit by 1982. Saddam looked for the most skilled architects in Iraq. Rifat Jadaji was serving a life sentence in prison and Mohammed Makia was, had already immigrated. Bring the inside out and the outside in, the president ordered. Jadaji was released in the summer of 1980 and was appointed as counselor to the mayor of Baghdad. Makia also returned to Baghdad. The preservation and development of Baghdad's heritage was the subject of a three-day symposium that was organized by the municipality of Baghdad at the National Council in 1980. Architects, engineers, writers, historians, religion scholars, professors, government officials all attended the symposium and engaged in its research proposals. Saddam Hussein attended much of the first two days and expressed his opinion on architectural heritage preservation and expressed his vision for local modern aesthetics. From time to time, men in military garb brought to the hall papers for the president to sign. On the third day, the attendees were informed that the afternoon session would be at the National Center for Engineering and Architectural Consultancy headquarters. In the evening of the same day, news broke out on Iraqi military aircrafts raiding Iranian airfields and military bases. From the hall of the National Council, Saddam Hussein was declaring war on Iran. No one expected the war to last until 1988. When the war was declared, the National Center for Engineering and Architectural Consultancy was about to complete its design for a nine identical high-rise building complex to be built as one of the eight projects on Haifa Street. Despite the war and under the slogan, one hand builds the other battles, the Iraqi government pursued a massive construction campaign facilitated by Rifat Jadirji and his team of con consultants. International engineers started to pour in, insurance companies to pull out, supplier exhibits put together, and Haifa street plans and photos published in world magazines. Jadirji was an Iraqi star architect 
who coined architectural theories and styles through his work and company Iraq Consult. He printed these experiments in several books, the most seminal of which is Al Ukhaidar and the Crystal Palace, a monograph he authored in prison between 1978 and 1980, but did not publish until early 1990s. Not only Jadirji designed the largest projects, but also survived the political shifts in the heads of authority in Iraq from the mid 50s until the moment he met in his prison garments Saddam Hussein. The architect then went home to shower and headed to his new office at the municipality. Jadirji divided Haifa Street into eight projects. To establish the design criteria for Haifa Street, he organized two design competitions. Al Mi'mar Engineering Bureau won the first, won the first and Technical Studies Alusi won the second. Alusi, who had held the position of the senior architect at Iraq Consult and thus worked very closely with Jadirji for years before leaving Iraq, set up his own business in Lebanon and Cyprus, was also summoned to return to Baghdad for the sake of Haifa Street. Alusi Chadirji and the director of the National Center for Engineering and Architectural Consultancy sat to discuss how to break through with such a detailed project in just under two years to be ready to host a conference of the non-aligned movement. To speed up the process and minimize technical errors, the initial architectural standards were set and printed in a 10-page booklet. The standards included detailed patterns, dimensions and styles of the streets, arcades and pathways, and simulated the historical Al-Rashid Street colonoided arcades. The booklet, serving as a handbook that set the foundations for the street's image, explained the architectural coherence and structural modulation for the provided references, floor heights and material types. Despite the diversity of the commissioned architects, the resulting architectural drawings of the buildings on Haifa Street seemed as if designed by one man. The familiarity is evident in the images of the models, perspective drawings, plans and sections of the various Haifa Street projects that were published in an issue of the Process Architecture magazine titled City of Peace, Baghdad 1979-1983. The Japanese magazine dedicated this 1985 issue in full to cover the development projects in Baghdad. Process Architecture magazine was like a catalog that would draw the attention of Japanese companies to the contracts they could earn in Iraq. A list of design and contracting companies in charge of each project was also included. Articles on Baghdad's architecture as well as etchings from Rafa Jadirji's different designs were also featured. The first part of the Haifa Street projects was assigned to MNR International from Brussels. Haifa 2 was assigned to Prisnet Misni from Paris. Haifa 3 to Arc Design Consultants from London. Haifa 4 to Richard England from Malta. Haifa 5 to Ali Musa and Sami Musawi from Baghdad and Manchester. Haifa 6 to the Technical Studies Office Maad Alusi's office in Baghdad. Haifa 7 was designed by the National Center for Engineering and Architectural Consultancy and Haifa 8 was designed by the design department at the municipality of Baghdad. According to the plans provided by the architectural design companies, the contractor of each project submitted a proposal that included a fixed price for all the works and included the necessary structural drawings. With the Iran-Iraq war in the backdrop, Baghdad was not building only, but also preparing for its future maintenance. Since eight contractors also meant eight different sources and technologies, a unified code was set by the local consultants to ensure a standardization of materials and services. This was to ensure the possibility of obtaining the future materials from ro local markets or importing them easily. These specifications, as well as samples of each material utilized in the project, were exhibited in a small museum erected on site. This unified code of work produced its coordination committee, of course, which required a resident engineer or a project manager with an experience of 20 years or more for each site. He would be assisted by an architect, a civil engineer, and an electric or mechanical engineer with 15 years of experience. Engineers were paid 8 to 10,000 US dollars a month. Project managers were paid $12,000 per month. Their contracts also included housing and air tickets for the employed and his family and a six-week annual leave. These benefits lured many international engineers to take part in the success of the construction works in Baghdad. Iraqi engineers were scarce at the time as their young had to join the military service and thus female local architects and engineers were trained to take up this work. The constructions in Baghdad could not be obstructed by the war. 
However, telecommunication services were interrupted by the circumstances of the war and project managers could not obtain permissions to use wireless phones on site. Except in Jadiji's office, he had a telex device installed in a room adjacent to his. Due to their proximity to the battlefronts, the Iraqi ports on the Arabian Gulf were too dangerous to use for the expanded scope of the works Baghdad was posing. Therefore, Mediterranean and Red Sea ports flooded with ships that brought goods and equipment to Iraq, and hundreds of loaded trucks queued for several days at the Turkish-Iraqi borders waiting to enter Iraq. Insurance companies could and would not cover works operated in war contexts or contexts affected by war, of course. But this did not discourage the international companies from working in Iraq and um, and the size and the budgets of these projects basically was far more tempting. Haifa Street was clouded with traffic dust and building debris, a warlike arena in which the technologies and timelines of construction were com- Repeating all financed by oil revenues. On Haifa Street, large areas were designated as camps for contractors. Each contractor could use a 10,000 square meter piece of land on which he built his prefabricated concrete production units, management offices, storage facilities, machinery workshops, workers' accommodation, as well as restaurants, shops, and entertainment facilities. Contractors also built aluminum workshops that produced doors and windows and carpentry shops to supply wooden doors and cabinets. A prefabricated cluster of six apartments could be produced, installed and delivered for finishing in just one day. At the time, about 80,000 workers lived on Haifa Street. Colorful helmets and construction shoes were worn. Temporary roofed pathways were built for pedestrians and the area was provided with 24-hour guarding. Art students drew on the wooden panels that fenced the projects. Hyundai, a Korean company that executed Haifa 5 and Haifa 6 projects, had its Korean laborers work from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. with one hour break. Evening shifts began at 6 p.m. and ran to 6 a.m. Their workers had one day off every two weeks. The dues were transferred to their families in South Korea, while workers received their overtime wages for the four hours at the completion or termination of their contracts. Women and children stayed up late to watch the masons under the flashing lights. The site on Haifa Street was successful in preparing the plan to be the center of attention in Baghdad. Artists were assigned to produce some works for the public spaces of the street. Hamad Ghani Hikmat designed the Statue of Justice in front of the Ministry of Justice building. Nuhar Radi made a ceramic mural sim- symbolizing the fishermen in the Shuwaka area. Saad Shakir proposed a ceramic monument in the Tala'a Square. Also, Several artists such as Ismail al-Sheikhli and Shakir Hassan al-Sa'id were commissioned to give five oil paintings, each measuring 90 by 50 centimeters, at the price of 500 Iraqi dinars each. They were installed at the building entrances. Those who worked on Haifa Street development did not know who would live in these buildings. The government made the decision towards the end of the construction. It subsidized 20% of the cost of the apartments. The apartment recipient paid 8% over 20 years at an annual interest of 2%. The price of some apartments was estimated at 37,000 Iraqi dinars, which equaled around 100,000 US dollars at the time. People named the apartment blocks on Haifa Street after the nationality of the contracting company that built them. Haifa 1, with its 162 apartments, was built by a Korean company called Hanyang, for 14 million Iraqi dinars. It was dedicated to state employees who did not own housing and were chosen based on a point system. The 400 apartments of Haifa 3 project, built by the Hewlett and Werner at the cost of 30 million Iraqi dinars, are also known as the German buildings. They were given to politicians who defected from the Syrian Ba'ath regime and therefore they are sometimes called the Syrian buildings. The nine Haifa 8 buildings, known as the Dutch buildings, were built by the Bredero for 17.5 million Iraqi dinars. 540 apartments, distributed over 15 floors, were given through a point system to university professors who did not own a housing at the time. On such residents, Alusi writes that, in all cases, quote, they were from the deprived circles of friends, acquaintances and relatives whose work in education could not provide them with the necessary income to own their own homes. End of quote.
This and their ideal location between the three universities in Baghdad and research centers, Alusi claims, were the reasons why he was encouraged to provide his professional services to the project. Alusi designed Haifa 6. It was built by Hyundai for 38 million Iraqi dinars. It has 377 three-bedroom apartments, 142 bedroom apartments, seven shops, two coffee shops, two pharmacies, two nurseries, three newspaper stands, three hairdressers, and two snack bars. Every housing block including included a nursery, and many of them had shops, cafes, pharmacies, bookshops, and laundry shops. 4. Due to the war with Iran, the non-aligned movement plan to convene in Baghdad in 82 was eventually cancelled. But construction works continued. By end of 82, Jadeji left Baghdad for good leaving behind an executive cadre led by Alusi who completed the works by spring of 85. As Haifa Street was preparing for the inauguration of its new projects, rockets fell on Baghdad, causing damage to some of Haifa 3 buildings. Insurance companies did not cover damages or delays caused by war and the German contractor did not want to repair the destroyed parts. But the Iraqi supervision committee reminded him that he signed a construction contract after the war, had, the war had started, and therefore he was obliged to do the repairs. The inauguration celebrations included walking on the streets from the ceremony site to an exhibit prepared about the project, its components, its details, and its stages. The attendees visit, visited the exhibition and were brief, briefed on the stages, hurdles, and successes. Finally, the representative of the president cut the celebration cake. In 86, Haifa 5 was inaugurated in what became known as Saddam Center for the Arts. The building was transformed by a specialized committee from a commercial center into a huge museum. Thousands of Iraqi artworks moved from Baghdad's museums into the center. Artist Layla Al-Attar, committee member and future director of the center, walked alongside President Saddam Hussein and his aides all the men in military uniform throughout the inaugural exhibition. Later, an Iraqi artist present at the opening mentioned that the president was not tolerant of the director's guided tour. As the president was convinced he could interpret art, he did show a similar attitude in architecture seminars before. Did the war necessitate that Haifa state be made with such distinction? What prompted the decision to engage in the works for globalists, artists, and companies despite the dangers of war? What is evident in Haifa Street? The banality of architecture? Or the steadfastness of the construction effort in times of war? Or the grief over those killed on the war front? What about the oil money that contaminated Iraq's war architecture? What about similar oil money that have imported architecture and architects from Baghdad along with their arches, concrete blocks, slender openings to neighboring states? Do they also have interlocking fates? Do these interlocking contexts give additional significance to buildings on Haifa Street? Do these stories positively or negatively affect their value? Would an apartment remain on Haifa Street offered for $100,000? Would that amount be expensive, considered expensive or cheap? Five. Did you know that all the buildings on Haifa Street have shelters equipped against atomic attacks? And did you know that an artist painted a super real reproduction of the inaugural presidential tour of the Saddam Center for the Arts and that this painting was hung in the center's main hall after Layla Al-Attar was killed by a U.S. airstrike in ba on Baghdad in 1993? 6. In her Baghdad diaries, Artist Nuharadi wrote, Silence prevails. It's six in the morning and no air raid. 
Depression has hit me with the realization that the whole world hates us and is really glad to ruin us. I had two dreams before the start of the war. The Americans in battle fatigues were jogging down Haifa Street and lining up in the roads, kissing each other. They were led by a girl in red dress and who was running very fast. Then suddenly the scene switched and I was coming out of the house and everything was dry as dust. Just earth. I was all alone. I said to myself, I will build and plant it so that it will be the most beautiful garden. When the Iran-Iraq war ended in 88, no one saw that the architectural practice in Baghdad, which had expanded greatly during the war, was about to be suffocated by another war that would start in two years when the Iraqi army invades Kuwait. In the Gulf War, Iraq was battling against a world alliance led by the United States of America who moved its forces to settle in bases around the Arabian Gulf. The first airstrikes in early 1991 hit important buildings in Baghdad, including government buildings designed by Jadirji. The facades of institutions such as the Ministry of Planning of Haifa Streets were charred. From Baghdad, the war was followed by a set of economic sanctions which destroyed Iraqi currency. For example, the wages of university professors did not change and became only a tenth of what they were before the blockade. They were not able to buy food with the same abundance and variety as they used to do during the Iraq-Iran war. Hunger was rampant in the neighborhoods surrounding Haifa streets while degrees of it varied among residents on the same street. Some of the new residents of the street demanded that a fence be built along the street so that children of the different neighborhoods would not mix. The most difficult thing was perhaps to carry a sack of oranges to an apartment on the 15th floor in the Dutch buildings without hiding the sack or giving what is in it to the poor neighbors who came to beg for food on Haifa Street. On the 42nd day, Nuhar Radi wrote, Defeat is a rock-bottom feeling. This morning, the 42nd day, the war stopped. They kept at us all night long, just in case we had a couple of gasps left in us. The noise was indescribable. They say Americans are in Nasiriya. Will they come to Baghdad? Like my dream, will they come marching down Haifa Street? Seven. After the fall of Baghdad in 2003, coalition forces led by the U.S. Army entered the city on 12th of April. The last pictures of Saddam Hussein were taken of him in military uniform on Haifa Street surrounded by supporters. The following rushes were traveling shots of the street's buildings as if taken from inside the car of the president who had chosen one of his safe hiding places in one of the roads leading to a Haifa Street. The locals had become accustomed to simultaneous appearances of several Saddam Hussein in different places across the city. It was perplexing until they understood that he had trained doubles to do so. Everyone had to know that the president could be president present everywhere and so we cannot know if the man who appeared in the video was the real Saddam Hussein, but like the arched colonnades, a replica of Saddam was good enough to prove he was alive and in power. Five years ago, as U.S. forces were entering Baghdad, the chairman of Iraq's Revolutionary Command Council went walkabout in his capital for the last time. 
Saddam Hussein al Tikriti would not be seen again until he was dragged from his spider hole hideout nine months later. These scenes were filmed by his official cameraman. Saddam's final public appearance was the last thing his cameraman ever filmed on his last day on the job. This footage never seen before. And here, the final shots from inside Saddam's car as it headed down Haifa Street. It was in the warren of alleyways behind the apartment blocks that line Haifa Street that Saddam set up his first hideout. It is where the Sunni insurgency was born. Guys, there's a group of standing in the street. Uh, got them? Yep. What's that bottle? See it? Yeah. off as soon as we can get a route out of here. Under the eyes of the U.S. Army, Saddam's statue fell and his palaces and state institutions were looted, including Baghdad's museums and works of art at the Saddam Center for the Arts. Saddam installed Haifa Street as a dividing line between areas of different sects. Long and awe-inspiring, Haifa Street remained calm for the first 18 months after the fall of the regime, until forces from the Iraqi resistance Al-Qaeda or elements of the old Iraqi army stationed in it and launched attacks on passing American and new um, Iraqi army troops. Video recordings of varying clarity show masked fighters maneuvering in and out of the arcades. The weapons in their hands varied as much as the head and face coverings they wore. The residents of the street would fear to pick up the wounded or the dead. They feared being kidnapped or sniped. This emptied the street if not already killed many of its residents. In early 2007, U.S. forces raided the street and Haifa street battles intensified. The arches and pathways planned by designers to search from end to end as shady place to move through on Haifa street 
became a bulletproof shelter. You could see in the footage presenting American soldiers hiding in the arcades perforated with bullets. The contours of the arcades and the high buildings of modern-day Baghdad appeared as a backdrop for the fighting parties. Soldiers also stationed on the roofs of Haifa street buildings because they are the highest in the area. The US Army also video recorded the movement of its soldiers during these battles on the street. A number of its soldiers uploaded videos on YouTube and labeled some of them with the details of the name or the dates of the battles. A number of these videos are described in the name of Tala'a Square, which is the heart of the German Haifa 3 residential complex of high-rise buildings. There we see up to air flo eight floors buildings overlooking the 15 floor buildings of Haifa 8, also known as the Dutch buildings. Here are some of these videos. Hey, man, let push it up a little bit. Sean Bartlett. Yeah. We see a hand, get out of the way. Yeah. 
I got two. Hey. Alright, hey, keep pushing to the roof. Right. Yeah. Hey, stay with me. Yeah, keep. Wait, Morty. No energy behind you. Spread it out. I want you to go out in the morning.
Baj Monty. Where's your bed? Okay, Baj Monty. I'll, I'll see you when we get back. Right? Back yet, or no? See you there, bitch. Okay. Palm trees, somebody down. Tracer, ah, oh, yeah, I keep your head down. fire coming from uh, Bravo 1 into the Hotel uh, 1 complex. Break. If uh, I'm seeing fire coming from uh, the east uh, checkpoint Austin, I'm heading towards Romeo. Roger, be advised. Hey, sorry, Corey. Is he uh, ING or no? Huh? He's ING, sir. He is. Oh. Who's on building 34? Nah. They said he's ING for sure. I never thought I'd be doing something like this. You know, you, you go out and you train, and it never hits you. It it doesn't even hit you when you get on the plane to come over here. 
it, it hits you when you get in your first fight. Reality. God, there's still a lot of dudes in that building. They're still going in, aren't they? Well, they need that many, though. I'm going to get clips there, maybe. At least I'm in front of you, huh? Get it done, boys. Did you hear what they did? They found a mortar around. Yeah. You hear what they're <clears throat> Gonna happen, you're gonna see a mortar round. As soon as you make this left about 10 feet in front of you, and right to the left of that, you're gonna see an IED, a 105 round or 155 round. You ready? All right, let's go. The filming is interrupted once again. The soldiers kick the wooden door, the doors open easily as if they had previously been opened or d and this is all a reenactment. One is asking for the keys again, batches of soldiers on the roof and others in the alleys behind the street. 
Each batch has five to ten soldiers. I lost my badge. Did you see it? Some soldiers are sitting on the ground and one is peeking through the slim opening in the freeze. Good day. Waiting. With the sound of shots, the camera moves towards the rays of sun setting behind the buildings of Haifa 8. Now it's clear. The soldiers are certainly on the roof of Haifa 3. Echo further traumatizes the sounds of bullets. I can't be sure, but it appears that the bullets are coming from building number one, one reported. AC boxes appear near the soldiers' boots. It does not occur to anyone upon boarding a plane on his way here until the fighting starts on his first day. This video is cut twice, before it moves to the arcade. Soldiers between arches climb up the stairs. These images complement the interior scenes taken at the beginning of the video. We could identify Iraqi army soldiers among the troops through their military outfit or their moustaches. Footage of subsequent footage of subsequent Iraqi-led battles shows bullets scarred arches. The operations purge the area of Sunni or unwanted fighters and confiscate ammunition such as rifles, explosives, small rocket launchers, and other. The camera shows a tank passing by palm trees, soldiers, and little robots that explore the small streets around Haifa Street. In a recording taken by a New York Times correspondent on Haifa Street on the 29th of January 2007, the camera and the soldiers break the doors of some apartments and search inside. Finding fresh food in the refrigerator meant that the apartment residents were able to quickly evacuate. In another apartment, they find a family of refugees warming in the dark near a kerosene heater, and they hear a moaning soldier after an Iraqi sniper shot him through the window. The soldiers evacuate in a hurry. Meanwhile, the camera records the details of the apartments from the inside. We see sofas, cupboards, libraries, ceiling fans, curtains, doors, wood carvings and decorations. We see tiles, heatings. Electrical appliances, computers, discs, metal security gates, and even sun rays as they penetrate the interiors. We could also see the architecture of the staircase dawned with decorative windows. Before these videos, and even though Haifa Streets and its buildings were highlighted in international magazines as previously mentioned, we have never seen these houses in this way before. We do not know who lived in these apartments before the raids. We do not know if they have ever returned to them afterwards. And if so, how did they feel about the vandalism exercised against them? How did Haifa Street residents repair their raided or vandalized apartments when peace was restored on Haifa Street by 2008? It's a horrible scene. Huh? Well, let's drag him in here. Yeah, Somebody get him in there. We can't get through here. Huh? You got hit right there in the window, right in front of the car. You might want to duck. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can you, can you be f***ing drag him? Come on, take this one. One, one. Uh, we have. Okay, we have okay. Down. Down. While the bomb-sniffing dog pants, Sergeant Leha's men rush into the room and put themselves in danger to pull him to safety. And as they wait for the medics, they try to keep each other calm and try to reassure their sergeant. Come on, sir. Hey, come on, sir. One bit, he's there right now, you say? Eight. Nothing remotely like Haifa Street has ever existed in Baghdad before, and insofar as the environment in which people live has any influence on their behavior or sense of who they are as a community, it can safely be said that an Iraqi nurtured in the bosom of Haifa Street will not resemble one nurtured in old Baghdad. Samir al-Khalil, The Monument 
After several years of amnesia, the memory comes back to the protagonist in Love in Baghdad from 1987. In the film, the protagonist eventually finds himself on Haifa Street. Amazed, perplexed and alienated, the man roams the street looking at the impressive structures that were built during his memory loss. Today, pictures of these houses can be found on many real estate websites allowing us to imagine how much it would cost to own one in a slowly recovering Baghdad. Sellers make sure to mention the quality of the neighbors before addressing the state of the building or its outstanding construction. Here's one announcement. Apartment for sale on Haifa Street, Korean buildings facing Tigris. Contains four balconies, three bedrooms, two bathrooms and on the first floor or higher. The age of the building is 20 years old. The apartment area is 164 square meters unfurnished. Cash payment only, price 170,000 dinar, Iraqi dinars, which equals around $117,000. Under this post, a female visitor wrote, These buildings are more than 40 years old. Many of the current residents of these buildings have inherited their apartments and their histories. I sometimes wonder if any of these apartments was in the Air U.S. Army videos. A press article from 2014 reported on how Iraqis were reluctant to live in high-rise buildings, especially those on Haifa Street. A real estate broker attributed the matter to the poor reputation of such buildings, the use of apartments for night parties, the histories of murder and kidnapping that took place in these apartments. It is for these reasons that the apartment prices have fallen, especially in 2006. The broker also spoke about officials who pressured residents to sell their homes because officials, these officials needed to live in such a neighborhood that is so close to their work in the green zone, which is a few minutes away from Haitfa Street. No more posts were added to these pages since I checked them in 2019. It is interesting to think of the moments when the residents move into and today out of their apartments on Haifa Street. A broken relationship with Baghdad does not recover through offerings on real estate websites or Haifa Street dedicated Facebook pages. Yet these outlet re- outlets, yet these outlets reconstruct an imagination of its architecture, even partially, and experience it as the scene of mega events for over four decades. When I found the apartment advertisements, I was fascinated by the relationship between the architectural and war context of these apartments and the normalization of living in them. This is Haifa Street, as Saddam Hussein had wanted it, as Rifa Jadirji had envisioned it, or as Iraqi and international experts repitched it. These are Haifa Street's trendy buildings to neighboring, exported to neighboring cities, to its residents to its poor neighbors, to resistant fighters, or to American soldiers. With this work, I try to think about the complexity in separating the war image from the architectural, understanding the architectural origins of the buildings, reconstructing, or perhaps creating a connection with the city. I cannot but wonder, what if an apartment on Haifa Street is my future property? What if we were living in the buildings we are trying to research their construction stories? What if we were their designers but locked outside them because of war, prison or exile? What if we were the autocrats who visited them a thousand times to check the contracts or to check the contractors were building the perfect neighborhood complete with its palm trees and fountains? Or What if we were the fighters who grew up in these buildings or in the neighboring Arab cities that imported the same style of architecture before being exported or re-exported as fighters, researchers who would hide behind these arches? Battles in a future estate. Thank you.